What's up, y'all, and welcome into the Jack Vita Show. I'm your host, as always, Jack Vita. We are back in action here on a warm Monday here in Chicago, one of the rare nice days we've had all year. Uh, and I'm joined by a man who is very familiar with the Windy City. Uh, he played here for 13 years. He was a first ballot Hall of Famer, went in in 2018. Uh, 2005 NFL Defensive Player of the Year, uh, the Defensive Rookie of the Year all the way back in 2000. And I had the privilege and the joy to grow up watching him play every Sunday here in the Windy City. Brian Erlacher, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on, Jack. Appreciate it, man. It's great to have you here, man. I want to start by showing you something here. <laughs> okay. Do you know what this is? Looks like a football. That's Rex Grossman's autograph. There's mine right next to it. Yes. Dude, that's a good autograph right there. That's And a then this legit. one. You know who this one is? Tommy Harris. Yep. You signed this ball for me in the Dude, year. what year was that? 2006. Because my autograph has changed since then. <laughs> <laughs> it's gotten much shorter and much – it was never pretty, but it's uh, def- that, that was one of the better ones that I've had right there. That's a good one. Yeah, I'll hold this up for people to see if they're watching. I love Rex's right. autograph. Rex had a great autograph. That is All, a- the, qu- all yeah. the quarterbacks do. It's, it's frustrating. It's annoying. <laughs> Why is that? I don't know. I just think that they uh, – I said, you should see Jay Cutler. Have you seen Jay Cutler's autograph? Have not. Very pretty. Very, uh, very like you can read his name. It's uh, it's nice. I'm just comparing it to mine, of course, but his is his is good. (laughs) Well, Tommy Harris here, he signed it with his number. Whoops, uh, 91, which he picked after the 91st Psalm, uh, his favorite Bible passage. So very nice. Yeah, Uh, I didn't. I didn't know that. That's cool. His dad was a pastor, correct? Yeah, I think that's right. Yep. Yep. Now, do you remember doing an autograph signing with those two guys? No. Where <laughs> were we? I, no, I'm not. That's Kenilworth, so long ago. Jim. Kenilworth Union Church in Kenilworth, Illinois, early 2006. Man, I don't know. I'm not good at – first of all, I'm not good at remembering. <laughs> that was a long time ago. <laughs> that was 16 years ago. Yeah, it was a long time ago. The funny story about this, so my – I wasn't allowed to go because I was grounded. So, <laughs> How old were you? How about that? <laughs> Let's see. 2006, I would have been 11. Oh, my gosh. You're so young. Okay. <laughs> 27 now. Yep. And so I was 11 then, and I got grounded for not doing my homework. And Good. Then, I like your parents already. <laughs> and then uh, my dad and my brother, they took this sweet, classic Wilson football, official football, got it signed for me. But they said that there was nobody at this thing. You guys were just sitting there by yourselves. Yeah, I, I honestly don't remember. Um, maybe that's why I don't remember because there was nobody there. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, uh, 2006, we were good that year. It was just before or after season. Before the season, but 2005, you guys were good that year too. Yeah, we were 11. Or wait, yeah, 11 and five in 05, and then 13 and three in 2006. Yeah, and I've so this ball it sits on my shelf back here for every episode. You got a lot of stuff back there, buddy. Yeah, it's like a mini Dan Patrick show set up. He's got the whole man cave. <laughs> He's got a lot, one. yeah. <laughs> Good starter set you got going there. <laughs> Thank you. I also, it's not here. I think it's at my brother's apartment. He's got the Brian Erlacher McDonald's bobblehead. You remember the those? lead, The lead paint one, yes. Yeah. <laughs> they quit making them, so they made them that year for me and Anthony Thomas. And then they, they like out. They uh they out they outlawed him after like what two months they have the, there's too much lead in the paint or something like that so they had yeah to some like kids were like licking the eating paint them and yeah <laughs> yeah no I don't think anyone died they didn't but die, it, yeah. it wasn't good but they, uh, they, they <laughs> something for the lead was too high I don't know They're do you great, have any know. of those still oh I'm sure I do somewhere I mean I dude, I got so much junk from over the not I'm sorry not junk so many things I've compiled over the years I have a storage shed that I. Uh, I, put, I don't really display anything in my house uh, from my playing days. I mean, we've moved. We moved um, well, a year ago. We moved, so I really put all that stuff away. So, did you move from out from one state to another, or you just been living the good life out in AZ? We, we stayed in AZ. We just moved to a different house, a better location, uh, kind of closer. We were kind of far out from everything. It took us twenty minutes to get to the freeway. Uh, just, just kind of far, and we moved a little bit closer. So, but not we were far away before, but we're kind of in the middle of everything now, which is a little bit nicer and more convenient. It's a great area. I love it here, man. It's a little we're getting warm now. Yesterday was 101. Today's high 90s. But hey, man, I know the sun's going to be up every single day. 
So I appreciate that. It may be really hot some days, but it's going to be uh, the sun's going to be up every day. So while we're taking a trip down memory lane here, talking about my childhood, I remember in 2000, your rookie year, yeah. the first Madden game I ever played, Madden 01. Did you have that? Do you have a copy of that one? Oh, I have, yeah, I never played video games, but I have. Oh. I, I, I do have some copies of the uh, the game, yes. Okay, so did you know that they mispronounced your name in that game? I did not know that. Well, how did they? I can't wait to hear they said it. How would you guess? Uh, Erlacher. Nope. Worse. Oh, I give up. What? <laughs> Al Michaels and John Madden were calling you Erlicker. Oh, that is even worse. You know, at the draft, <laughs> Tagliabue called me Erlacher. And with the ninth pick in the 2000 draft, the Chicago Bears select Brian Erlacher. I was like, what? I, I didn't care at the time, obviously. I was just happy to be drafted, but uh, definitely butchered my name. It's not a hard one to but I mean, it's it's easy to butcher because it's the spelling's not normal. So I got to ask you, first of all, what was your what was your thought process when you got drafted by the Bears? Because you played – I know you played a lot of defensive back in high school and college. You played some mm -hmm. running back too in high school, right? No. what Receiver? Like, receiver. I was a receiver. Yeah, running back like situational, maybe twice a game. Um, some screw the defense up stuff, but nothing, nothing, uh, legitimate. Um, I was pumped, man. Shoot. You know, I just got drafted number nine overall in the 2000 draft. So I didn't really, honestly, I didn't care where I got drafted. You know, I grew up a Dallas Cowboys fan, so I knew I wasn't going to go there. And it's funny, uh, Mel Kuyper with his first mock draft when the season was over, had me going number nine to the bears. Uh, I don't know how, it's just amazing to me how the guys can, project that stuff because you don't know what teams are thinking you don't know what their need you know what their needs are but you really don't know you're all it's all projection so um he had me pegged there from day one and i was like man that'd be really cool to go there but i just you know uh number seven was arizona and that was close to home as well so i was actually kind of hoping to go there but i'm glad i didn't i'm really glad i got drafted by the bears yeah and it was a fun era of bears football now, you made the move over to middle linebacker, and I know that they had you playing outside linebacker in yeah. preseason. Did you see the clip I sent you of Brad Culpepper talking about you, your rookie year? Yeah, yeah. Dude, I was so bad at – and I don't think Brad got there until later in the season. He got there, like, maybe right after training camp. I was so bad, Jack. I mean, so I was – in college, I was a space guy. You know, I played 10 yards deep and just ran to the football. Um, and then they thought that the best way for me to get on the field as a rookie was be at Sam because it's a – most simple position my butt it was hard for me man I, you know they put me on the tight end every play i didn't really have room to run around um and on third downs i would play mike i would be our nickel third down guy so i'd play a little bit of that but um i did not enjoy playing salmon roosevelt rosie colvin beat me out but two weeks into training camp it was pretty obvious who the better sam linebacker was and that was rosie so uh good for him and you know he had, he had a, actually a great career uh not only with the bears but with the patriots as well yeah who were you tight with early in your career? The whole – all linebackers were great. Roosevelt, Warwick, um, uh, B-Rob was great. Uh, at, not for, at first he wasn't great, but the, the more you got to know him, he was a great teammate. All, all the guys I played with early on were awesome. Uh, Jim Miller, Shane Matthews were great. Uh, Marty Booker, uh, Jim Flanagan was there in my rookie year. Mike Wells, you know, because those names, you, I'm not sure if you remember those guys. I remember, I remember yeah. some, yeah. That was the beginning There's, of my football knowledge. Yeah, although Marcus Robinson was cool. Uh, James, just so many guys. Olin was there still, so Olin Krutz. Uh, just so many good dudes um, early on that I got, you know, my first couple. We had some solid, solid vets uh, my first couple of years. How rough was it? I think I can't remember which year it was, but there was a one year where you guys had to play in Champagne. Was that 2002. Just brutal? You know, the fans were amazing in Champagne. I'll tell you that much. They they came out and supported us, but you know, we played 16 row games that year. You know, we we either traveled to Champagne on Saturday or traveled to wherever we whether it was Green Bay, Detroit, it was whatever. Just 16 row games because you traveled every weekend. That was tough. We started out two and zero. We beat um, who we beat at home? Minnesota, maybe the first game of the year. Okay. And then we go to Atlanta and beat Atlanta in Atlanta. And then we're up 20 to three at home in which is Champaign versus New Orleans. And we lose 23 to 20. And that we lost eight games in a row. Uh, that was our eight game lose streak. We were two and eight. Uh, just, just a terrible season, man. It was frustrating. Lovey coming in. Did that feel like a turning point for the team, for you in any way? Well, well I didn't know what to expect. Honestly, when he first got there, I had no idea what to expect. You know, he was a D coordinator. His defense was awesome. I knew that much. I won. 
I was excited to run his defense. But for the middle linebacker, man, it wasn't good. You know, all we did was run through. I watched his defense all those years in Tampa and in, and in uh, St. Louis. And the middle linebacker in cover two literally just turned and sprinted down the middle of the field. I was like, I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be doing that. Um, and then we really changed his defense. They let us kind of put our input on it and what we thought would be better for our team. And we changed the whole cover two scheme. Um, it, every year it evolved thanks to him, Coach Babich, Coach Marinelli. They would listen to our in, my input, Lance's input, and everyone else on defense, our input. And it, it was awesome. But the thing, the most – the takeaways that's what he preached that's what we did we, we took the ball away we scored uh that was his number one thing and that's what we were really good at so lovey was an assistant for tony dungy one of the greats mm. and i know dungy has talked a lot about not only wanting to build these guys on the football field but also to develop good men off the field did yeah. you feel that lovey carried those similar faith core values with coaches? thousand percent you know it, it, i never heard lovey say a cuss word darn <laughs> dang shoot <laughs> crap and crud if you got one of those words out of lovey you better pay attention because something was wrong <laughs> so it's just just an amazing i mean it's in, in the football world it's hard to do that because you there's so many you know so easy not to, to open your mouth and cuss um but he never did it um you knew right away what his values were. He let that be known right away. Uh, and, and like he's like, you don't want to let Lovey down. He was like your dad. You know, it's like you don't want to let this dude down because he's such a good, good, such a good man. And he he, he wanted all of us to be better men as well. He he didn't coach us. Um, let me see. He, he didn't like guys that didn't want to get better on and off the field, if that makes sense. He, and you can tell that by the guys they drafted. For the most part, there were some guys that are questionable. But for the most part, we had a bunch of good guys on our team when he was there. That's funny because that was the exact same thing that Brad told me about coach Dungy. He said, he's like yeah. your dad. You don't want to let your dad down. You're exactly right, man. You do something like in a game or even the games or whatever, cause you're going to make mistakes, but off the field, if you made a mistake or did something that you weren't, you knew you were wrong. You're like, dang, I got to go to Lovey's office now and, and tell him or, or have a conversation about what I did that I shouldn't, I knew I shouldn't have done. You know, it's a, it's just, you just don't want to let the guy down. You don't want to disappoint him. <laughs> so, Lovey, he did. Now he's over there in Houston. Are you excited for him with this opportunity? Yeah, excited and nervous for him. You know, I I don't know how much talent they have. You know, I, he's a great Lovey's a great coach. And you look last year on defense. He was a, they had a bunch of takeaways on defense last year. And I, uh, wherever he goes, they're gonna they're gonna do that because that's the way he is, and that's just what he preaches, and and it works for some reason. He gets it done better than anybody else. Um, I just worry about the other side of the football. You know, I, I don't know who their quarterback is. I don't know what they got. Davis going Mills, I think. From is he Stanford. still there from last yeah. year? Okay. Um, he had some big games last year. You know, you just I, – I hope he wins. You know, their division – that division is probably wide open. and everyone's going to – you know, thinks Tennessee is going to run with, away with it every year. But I think that division is pretty open, so they could compete. Who are you watching typically on Sundays these days? I honestly watch no one. Um, uh, we I, I do watch games. Don't get me wrong. We live in Arizona, so whatever game is on, um, if it's a game I want to watch, we'll watch it. I don't sit around here and be like, oh, who's on today? I can't wait to watch. That's not – you know, we would typically get up. I go for a bike ride, and then it's uh, it's earlier here, which is nice. So the games start at 10 or ten or 11. It changes at some point during the season. It gets a little bit later. But we don't sit around – and, and wait for games unless it's Dallas. Then I get a little excited if I get if I find we got the Dallas Cowboys on here. I get a little excited because uh, that's my team. And I grew yeah, up a still? Cowboys fan. And oh heck yeah, man, that's my squad. And they're fun to watch. You know, Dak's a great quarterback. I love Coach McCarthy. Does a good job. Good players through and through. So I like watching them. But um, other than that, man, I, I, whoever's on is, is what we watch if, if we watch it all. How about Saturdays? Same deal? Just college, yeah. On? Well, shoot, college, you got everything on, man. There's so many different um, – and it's great here because it starts at 9 and 10. So you got these games. I'll wake <laughs> up, go for a bike ride, um, and you're literally watching football all day long. And I do like to possibly make some wagers on some games, which makes it even more fun. So, um, <laughs> yeah, college football is a great, man. It's so much fun to watch. I was out there in Phoenix in September, and I was staying at my buddy's apartment – and that Saturday was so much fun. It was just wake up at nine o'clock with yes. uh, Wisconsin versus Notre Dame is on. We're cooking up breakfast. We watch that. And then we just hang out at the pool at his apartment complex and we just watch games, all, TVs all over the place. Yeah, like, it's amazing. I'm doing it wrong here. 
Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> you got what you got. But, yeah, it's just, it is nice during football season to, to get that early start, man, because, you know, I get excited for, for football, for, for college football. And the earlier it starts, the better it is for me because I can, like I said, I can wake up, go ride my bike, and then plop my butt on the couch and watch games all day. Are you enjoying the NFL or college more these days? Um, I guess college, you know, if I had to choose one. Um, there's so many rules in the NFL. Okay. They change them every year. And uh, it's still fun. They got, it's the highest level of football, obviously. But I, I, the last couple of years, I, I kind of – I didn't watch it. But three years ago, I kind of quit watching. And even the year after that, I, I kind of fell away from watching it. And then last year, I started watching a little bit more. But college is, has always been fun to watch. Even when I played, college was a blast to watch on Saturdays, whether we're traveling or home. You always get to the hotel and you watch games. That's what you do. You know, you got guys yapping back and forth about their teams playing th that team. And it's just, uh, it's just fun. You know, the, the environment around college football is a blast. I really miss 2000s NFL because I was watching your game against the Arizona Cardinals, the Monday night game from 05 yeah, or 06, sorry. Game. 06, yeah. yeah. 06. Oh my gosh. What a great game. But you know, I've, when I watch these old games, I just enjoy them so much more. I mean, there was more physicality. Yeah. There's a little more of a balance between run and pass. Like nowadays I feel like everyone's running the same offense. They all, it's all throwing the short passes as, as taking over the running game. You look at, I was watching something the other day. The linebackers are getting smaller and smaller because nobody really runs the football anymore. You know, there's the balance is you, you throw these little hitch screen or these little pop passes to the slot guy, or you know, you swing your back out. You throw that's they're using that to get three or four yards in the running game. So it's just a different game now. It's not as enjoyable to me to watch. It's hard to play defense now because of all the rules. Uh, if I was a DB in the NFL, it would be impossible to play defense. I mean, a corner you can't touch around to five yards. You know, and the thing that makes me mad is like. They'll put a um, – they'll say, okay, this year we're going to watch – the refs, will, the, the NFL about, okay, we're going to watch offensive holding this year a whole bunch. So whether it's – and then you see the offensive holding penalties go up. Well, if it's not holding, don't call it. Just because they're putting an emphasis on something doesn't mean you have to call it if it's not there. Or we're going to put an emphasis on defensive holding. And you see these penalties just shoot up. I'm like, well, why are you calling it if it doesn't happen? I mean, I just – the refs drive me crazy. It's not their fault. The NFL is putting an emphasis – on certain things so they have to watch it and call yeah, it when it's not there that's the thing for me is that with the nba and the nfl when i grew up in the 2000s defense won championships nba and, back in your when you were younger when i was young unbelievable you know those dudes battled they got it they, they could foul each other and not have to you know no one gets thrown out of a game or a flagrant in two and this and that you could actually play basketball physical and now it's just a three-point contest. Spread the floor. You don't see big guys anymore. And that's what – part of this thing that I like, Brian, was – and you still see it in college, a diversity of styles. So if I want to watch a Big Ten grind it out, oh. it might punt a lot, run. 12 to, yeah. <laughs> big Ten, man. It's, uh, and those that's what we get here early in the morning. You know that. Yeah, um, of course. Yeah, I, I actually I haven't watched an NBA. I couldn't say that's time to watch NBA. It's been at least three or four years since I watched. So I, I don't even know what they do anymore. Uh, Kyle, my daughter goes to KU. So this was a big season for her. Uh, Kansas won the national championship. So that was cool. College basketball is still fun to watch. Uh, but, yeah, like you said, college football, man, you could get some – you got the – like you said, the pack is it the Pac-12 or the Big Ten? And then the uh, Big 12, yeah. 71, 70, you might yeah. get a score. It's just SEC, you never know what you're going to get. It's just – it's crazy with all the, di the uh, different styles of these conferences. Would you do anything to change college football? Would you like a bigger playoff system? Would you, Do you like the NIL stuff? I don't have any idea what the NIL stuff means, so I have no <laughs> idea. Uh, I know okay. the kids have – anytime these kids get a chance to make money, I'm on board with it because – the NCAA makes so much money off of them. You know, they got – it's just – and these, most of these kids come from nothing. I know I came from nothing. You know, you have no money in your pocket. And you saw the quarterback from Ohio State a few years ago got suspended, what, two or three games for selling a jersey for 400 bucks. And he probably did it because he needed the money. I'm assuming, you know, it, it just doesn't make sense to me that these kids can't take advantage of, the, of their, their, their value. Uh, they can a little bit more now, but – uh, I would like to see more playoff games just because they're fun. You know, I wish it was an eight, eight, eight team system or however they're going to do it, but just because they're fun. I like the way it is now. The four teams is fun as well, but um, I don't really know, man. Just the games are so fun to watch. 
I put together a 2014 playoff for fun last oh, wow. winter. It's too many football games. These kids are going to get beat up. Well, you have to shorten the regular season. Ugh. You know, you'll like that. Well, so I like where I like the 24 game because well, the NCAA should love it because it's going to create more money, more money for them. You know, it's more money in their pocket, which is all they really care about. Um, so yeah, I mean, more game, more big games is always a good thing. Here's the thing. The kind of schools that you and I went to, you went to New Mexico. I went to Valpo. I mean, Valpo is an FCS non-scholarship team. So Valpo wouldn't get in. Yeah. But the, the, I want to see the small conference teams. I want every get conference shot. champion get a chance to play. That's why I, I don't disagree with you. Yeah. You, you, people always talk about the discrepancies between the conferences and how good this team is. And Let them play and let's find out that, you know, at the NCAA tournament, you get those upsets, man. It, it's yeah. crazy. You know, 15 versus two this year happened again. Kentucky got beat. But, yeah, you just – you don't know until they play. You can talk about it all you want to, but they don't have to be better for that one game. You know, you can go out there any game and you never know what's going to happen. So, let, let them play. I like, I like where you guys are on that one. Now, you mentioned that your daughter goes to Kansas. I had a former player, Kansas player, Scott Pollard. He was on the show last yeah. week. You yeah. told me that. Yeah, you, you told me that. Yeah, He's a great guy. You would love him. Yes. He he told me, though, he said last week, he said he thinks Kansas needs to join the Big Ten as soon as possible. What do you think? Stay in the Big 12, move over somewhere? Why go? The Big Ten's so boring to watch. <laughs> I mean, I, I, nothing, no, their, their games are just, it's like 48, 46. It's, um, I mean, they, they could, I mean, I, I think Kansas would do really well in the Big Ten if they did join Michigan State's in there, who I love watching as well, but. Yeah, I guess if they did join, they'd do really well. I just don't know why they would. I guess, well, no, there's teams leaving the Big 12 because yep. of the SEC, they're going to the SEC, the Oklahoma and Texas, right? Yeah. So, yeah, but they're not powerhouses in basketball anyway, so it doesn't really matter, I guess. Um, but you look at football-wise, maybe Kansas will have a chance to win a couple more games now. <laughs> maybe one game. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't necessarily agree with that. You know, I mean, uh, I don't know. what I mean, he would know, he would know better than I would as – a former basketball player, but I, I liked him in the, uh, in the big 12. Yeah. I think that the big 12 is still going to be a competitive uh, for basketball, especially last year was probably the, this past season, I'd say it was the best basketball conference. And now you're bringing in BYU, Cincinnati, Houston. Oh, uh, I didn't know that. So those are some good teams there too. Yeah. And Houston. I think Houston's, Houston's great. Houston's good at football too. Case they Kino. are good. Agreed. Yeah. Case team. That's right. And the, uh, last year they were good at, Good at football. That uh, can't remember the quarterback's name, but they they put up some points in basketball. They're elite eight again, right? Yeah, elite so eight, final four the year good. before that. I they think compete. They're, they're going to do better than Texas. I think than Texas has done the last couple of years. Football and basketball wise, yeah. right? Texas, Texas to me is just I don't know what happened to their sports. Uh, football and basketball is just kind of going the wrong direction. Who did you play with from Texas? Who played at Texas on that defense? There was somebody from Nate Vasher. Little Nate. Yeah, yeah, Dude, yeah. Nate yeah. was a beast. So I think Nate had 10 picks one season. Um, 2005, I think Little Nate had 10 picks. Uh, he was a good football player. Yeah, he. Uh, we also had Blake Brockermeyer. It was a left tackle for us my rookie year. Uh, of course, we drafted Cedric Benson, number four, uh, in 2005 or whatever it was. Uh, I can't remember any other guys from, from UT. Well, and Tommy yeah. Harris, he played at Oklahoma. Oklahoma, yeah. Yeah. But uh, I was wondering, you could, you got to text Nate one of these. If you still are in touch with him and just ask yeah. him what happened to Texas football. And nothing hurts their feelings more than asking him that question. <laughs> the guys, <laughs> they have so much pride. Those Longhorn guys, man, they uh, <laughs> they don't like that question because they're, they're rooting for them. And the crazy thing is that school has so much money. They have, you know, they've gone through a few coaches the last few years too, trying to figure out what the reason is. But I don't know. That's a good question. I, uh, I, that's a good way to hurt their feelings, though, is to ask him what's, <laughs> what happened to their football team. <laughs> yeah, I saw Sam Acho the other day, um, but I didn't want to. He's a lot bigger than I am, so I didn't want to ask yeah. him that in person. <laughs> yeah, probably probably a good idea. <laughs> uh, let's see. Okay, well, let me ask you this. Do you have any other kids? I mean, you said four kids, <laughs> Yeah, right? I have three kids, yeah. Three kids. So three I, have a, kids. Yeah, I have a daughter who's 21, goes to KU. Uh, another daughter who's 17 and goes to Hamilton High School here in Arizona. And my son's 16 and he goes to Chandler High. So, yeah. Where's getting close seven? to getting them out of the house. Getting close. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Good and bad. I guess I don't know. I mean, I like to find out. I'll tell you what. I, I would, <laughs> hopefully, I'll get them all three off to college, and then we can figure it out. Then I think I've done my job. But uh, yeah, my kids are awesome, man. They're they're so much fun. It's been being retired was the best thing that happened to me. Just 
you know, I spent a lot of time with him when I played, but it's just different when you have all the free time in the world to, to do whatever you want to travel, hang out. You don't, I don't miss their stuff. It's a, uh, it's just fun. So someone asked me, I was over at the school. I substitute teach at, and yep. I was like, yeah, I'm going to run. I'm going to talk to Brian Erlacher in a little bit. And everyone's like, Oh my gosh, Brian Erlacher. No way. <laughs> and they're like, what is he up to now? I yeah. was like, well, I will ask him, but I get the impression golf, Working out, yeah. Out with uh, working out is not very high on my list. You know, I, I ride my mountain bike or my road bike. I don't. I haven't touched the weight in over two years. I just um, I don't have any games coming up. You know, I don't really need to yeah. get the bulk back on me. So I do. I do push ups. I'll ride my bike and then I'll do push ups and sit ups. I don't want to get fat. That's my number one thing. <laughs> and if I, I won't change my diet, Jack. So I keep eating like crap. Um, <laughs> but I uh, I ride my bike enough to, to supplement that, and I just. I golf, I fish, um, travel a little bit, hang out with the fam. It's nice. I'm enjoying myself. The last time you were in Chicago was when? That's a good question. I was actually there for like three hours uh, three weeks ago. I landed, went downtown, met with these people, and then went to the airport and left again. So that was, yeah, I guess three weeks ago I was there for, for a couple hours. My brother and sister live there, so I try and get back and, much, and see them as much as I can, but, but they much prefer coming here over me going there. The weather here is, they, like I said, they know the, the weather here is going to be great. So they, they enjoy coming here. Well, if you got off at O'Hare, you saw all the billboards. Oh, with your dude. Face on them. Yeah, I've seen those for six, seven years now. Yep. There's a <laughs> bunch of them, man. My man Jordan over at Restore likes those things. He puts them up. Um, they're funny. You know, the, some, of the, some of the sayings are pretty funny on them. What do they say? I never, I never actually read them. I don't read them either. I don't want, I don't want to look at them. I don't, I don't have to approve them. How about that? He just, Jordan <laughs> thinks of one <laughs> and, uh, and they go up. So, you know, I, I don't read them. I, I get embarrassed looking at them. And I, you know, of course, everyone, when they land in Chicago, send me pictures. They're like, Oh, look who I saw. Like, oh. My niece, my brother's daughter, when they're driving down the freeway, she'd be like, uncle Brian, uncle Brian, uncle Brian. She's always screaming my name. So that's good. <laughs> Well, it's also funny. We keep, we keep going back to Brad Culpepper. Have you gotten off the Tampa airport recently? He's got billboards everywhere. Brad does? What for what? Law firm. Ooh. No, I did not know that. So when was the last time? I couldn't tell last time I flew to Tampa. Uh, I drove. Oh, I just flew to Tampa last year, but I didn't see his. Uh, well, it was two years ago. Anyway, yeah, I didn't pay attention, I guess. I put, you know, rental car, you got to pay attention to the road. New place, driving, don't really look at too many signs. But uh, that's great. Good for him. He yeah. was a smart guy. Very smart guy. One of yeah. the smartest D linemen I played with. You know, he he, he knew he knew the ins and outs of, of how to play de defensive linemen. It wasn't very big either, so he had to be a little bit smarter than everybody else. I mean, how many guys in the NFL that you you played thirteen years for thirteen mm -hmm. years, right? Thirteen, yeah. Thirteen. How many guys did you meet that were in the same ballpark in terms of intelligence as that guy? Like, how as many Brad? guys are really smart in the NFL? Well, so there's me, um... of course. <laughs> Of course. Uh, you know, Nick Roach is one of the smartest guys I played with. Hunter Hillemeyer, super smart guy. Mike Brown, uh, smart guy. And M Mike was the smartest football guy I played with. Uh, just super intelligent. Um, and then obviously Hunter and Nick, you know, Hunter went to Vanderbilt. Nick went to Northwestern. So pretty smart guys. Uh, I'm trying to think who else, man. Those, those three right there are probably the three of the the main ones, if I had to pick anybody. Mike like, Brown. Culpepper, obviously. Yeah. Mike Brown, when he was healthy, was so good. Dude, he was unbelievable. Man, when he – that first year he got hurt, 2004, when he – I think he tore his ACL or was Achilles maybe against uh, Green Bay. Man, he just wasn't the same after that. You know, then the next year it was the calf, and then the year after it was his ACL. Just – Love that dude. We were drafted the same year, and our defense wasn't the same, and he wasn't in there. You can say whatever you want to about me being on the field or D lineman. When Mike Brown wasn't on the field, our defense was totally different. Would you say he or someone else who was the next most important player on that defense besides you? <laughs> besides me, I'm glad you said that. Uh, <laughs> uh, Mike, uh, excluding Mike Brown as well. Yeah, dude, it's. It, <sighs> It's so hard because, you know, Tommy Tommy Harris was a big deal because the three technique in, in Love – are you talking about Lovey's defense, correct? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the three technique in Lovey's defense was a big deal because they could wreak havoc up the field in the quarterback's face in, in, in the run game. Um, and Tommy was the most explosive guy I've seen up front. Man, that dude got off the ball. 
He was up the field in gaps, and he defined – like, we all have gaps, obviously. Tommy would define exactly where he needed to fit right when the ball was snapped. It was like, bam, okay, that's I don't need to go there. Go here. So whether it was a right or wrong gap, it didn't matter to us as linebackers because Tommy made it happen so fast. Tank Johnson was great as well. Tank would get up the field and get in his gap. Um, so I'm going to go a little bit. Julius Peppers was an unbelievable football player. Oh, yeah. That dude, right? And it was, this was later, obviously. Yeah. But, man, you know, 6'7", 285, 4'6", 4'7", 40". He was, in my opinion, the best athlete I played with. You look at the things he could do at his size, and he busted his butt every day in practice. He played hard. I just, um, he was amazing. He'll be in a Hall of Fame in a year or two. Whenever he's eligible, he'll be a first. He should be a first. You never know with these guys, but should be a first ballot Hall of Famer. It's weird. <clears throat> I don't like this Hall of Fame selection process. Don't get me started on this. You told me you want to be PG today, so I'm gonna. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about that right now, Jack. <laughs> I get a little mad talking about guys that should be in the Hall of Fame and guys that sh everyone who gets in deserves to be in. I'm not going to say that because they're all the great players. But Zach Thomas, to me, how is Zach Thomas not in the Hall of Fame? How is Olin Krutz not get more recognition for the Hall of Fame? Uh, Charles Tillman, how about – look at his stats. I know he didn't make the, the Pro Bowls. Everybody looks at that Pro Bowl crap oh, like it means something. No one cares a popularity the contest. There, you, thank you. It's the, the, play, the fans vote on it and the players – you know who I voted for on, on other teams when I voted for the Pro Bowl? Who? Whoever was not going to put my – like, say the other team had a uh, – like, our, our say Olin, our center, was should be in the Pro Bowl. So I would vote for a center that I never heard of. <laughs> so they didn't – so it didn't count against – so, like, say Dominic is who I should be voting for, the kid up in uh, uh, Detroit. I should have voted for Wyola, but I wouldn't because I knew it would, it would hurt Olin if I voted for him. That's how my take was. I, I wanted all my teammates to get in, so I vote for a guy I never heard of. So it doesn't make sense, you know. It's all it's just a, like you said, popular. And then you go, and then you end up going go to the uh, the GMs and the fan vote to really see who, who makes it to the to the Pro Bowl. So those never really, I never really cared about the Pro Bowl, you know. So I think I went to played in three games right when I started first started going. Then I would never go after that, and I was always hurt. <laughs> my big toe was was stubbed or something, so I couldn't go to the Pro Bowl. It's it's such a waste of time. It is so stupid. Did you? I'm curious though. You remember that show? I don't know if you were on it. Remember the ESPN had that show that was like the Battle of the Gridiron Stars. Yes. Did you go so on in, that? I went on one. Yeah, I went. There's two different ones I went on. There was one in 2000. It was right before the Super Bowl in Tampa. It's a def, It was a defensive challenge. It was me, Warren okay. Sapp, Jason Taylor, Leroy Glover. There was like six or seven of us. It was a defensive battle thing. And then there was one called the All-Stars Challenge in 2001. I went on down in um, – but this was like all kinds of different athletes. There was Herman Meyer, the downhill skier. Uh, Ray was there, Ray Lewis. Uh, I was there. Terrell Owens was in it. And Ron, Ron Day Barber was – there was like 10 different um, ten different guys. But, yeah, the, the, the challenge things – I wish they would do that, the competitions challenge. Those are great. Those are fun for me to watch too on TV. Yeah, I was going to say – Skills challenge. Not only do they look f like they're fun to watch, they look fun to participate in. And they had that show, The Battle of the Gridiron Stars, where it would be like Junior Seau and yes. I think who else? Who else was on that show? Oh, Jason Witten, he'd be another one. And it'd be like they're playing Witten dodgeball. Was on there. And it, they'd be so they, well, that's the Pro Bowl thing. They do the, the, the Pro Bowl challenge thing before, like on Thursday of the Pro Bowl week. Now they do the challenge, they'll have dodgeball. They'll have um, a throwing competition. They did like There's a home like, run derby on this show. They should do like six or seven different challenges. Like and let long make sure drive. Everyone, yeah, make everyone compete. Pick your best at each one. And then screw the game. The game's boring anyway. Yeah. Do they even play the game anymore? Do they yeah, play they this do. year? Sadly, yeah, I, they I, mean, do. I don't even watch. Yeah, uh, but yeah, I mean, just do something fun like that. Because the fans like that stuff too. And then the, then the players are more available to the fans as well. You know, you, you pack the stadium, do all these skills challenges, and then no one gets hurt. Well, we talked about how we can fix the Pro Bowl. How would you – what would you do to fix the NFL? What would you change about it? Oh, uh, um, you know, I, I just – like we talked about earlier, it's, it's not that physical of a game anymore. You know, it's, it's hard to play defense, and I understand fans want to see points. I get it. I like watching games, but, but there's a lot of points scored too. I, they're more fun to watch. But it's just, it's just hard to, for those guys to play defense. It's frustrating. It, it's, it makes it even more amazing when you see – really good defense these days, you know, because it really doesn't exist anymore because the rules are all stacked against them. But, um, you know, I, the thing that makes me mad is 
and even quarterbacks are starting to stand up for this as well. Is like you get a D lineman who gets thrown into the quarterback by an offensive lineman, and they call a penalty on the defensive lineman for hitting them in the knees. Or you get a guy who gets a sack, it gets a roughing the passer penalty. How the hell do you get a roughing the passer for sacking the quarterback? That's just, there's certain things, and, and quarterbacks are starting to speak out against some of these rules too, because they know that they should be protected, no doubt. That's where all the money is. I know, I know, I know how the game's played, but they still need to, you know, they're still football players and they understand that. Who's the best Bears quarterback of the new millennium? Of the new millennium? Kyle Orton. Yeah. Kyle Orton. Yeah. Kyle Orton is the best Bears quarterback of the new millennium. Best, the best one I played with. Um, I mean, you look at, I mean, I'm not a numbers guy. I'm, I'm a wins guy and a, uh, a leadership guy. And Kyle, to me, I still don't know why they traded him. I, I'm sure we still could have got Jay and just traded two first round picks and kept Kyle as the backup. I'm sure, I mean, it's easy said now, but I wish that's what would have happened because then we would have had a really, really good backup for those games that, you know, that Jay wasn't there. Jay was great. Jay was the most talented quarterback I played with. That dude could make every throw. He was athletic. Uh, man, he, he was really talented. But Kyle, I think I played with Kyle for two or three years. I just liked the way he led our team. The, the offensive linemen respected him. Uh, the defense respected him. Our coaches respected him. It just, uh, I like the dude. So you would have, if you were running the team, because there was a time when Grossman came back, would you have kept Orton in there starting? No, no. no? They, they, that, that, that was a good move. You know, it was Kyle's rookie year. We won, a, we won games that year because of our defense. And Coach Smith, we ran the ball. Thomas Jones and Cedric Benson had a ton of carries that year. It was the way it should have been. We protected Kyle as much as we could. And he was a rookie. I'm talking like a couple of years down the line is when he started starting for us. He was, he was Rex's backup for a couple of years. And then once he got his chance, he, he did a pretty good job for us. Uh, but yeah, Rex was a stud. Uh, he, he should have been back in there. Rex is a gunslinger. Love that dude. There's not a lot of guys I, I didn't like, honestly. Um, Rex threw it all over the place. It was fun. Um, great attitude as well. Do you have a good relationship with Cutler? Yeah, I like Jay. Um, I, I mean, so I, I think I like him more now than I did when I played with him. <laughs> If that makes sense, <laughs> you know, it was it was hard like during during season and stuff. It's hard to get it's hard to do things. You guys, they have families away from football, so you don't do a lot of stuff. But um, yeah, I, I mean, looking back, I mean, he he, had, he was a talented guy. Like I said, he just he made some throws. There was no throw that he could not make. He, he could do it all. And then in today's game, he'd be great because now the quarterbacks are running around more. And back then, they didn't really, you know, that wasn't really a big deal. So he'd be even more dangerous now. What's your funniest Jay Cutler story? Shoot, I don't even know, man. I um, I think I only played with Jay for two years, maybe three yeah. years. I don't remember. Um, I think he was 09, 2010. 2011. 09, I missed, the, I missed the whole season in 09 because of my stinking wrist. Um, 2012. Oh, here's a good story. Shoot, man. We're playing dodge. We used to play dodgeball every Saturday in the, uh, in the locker room before we'd either travel where we were going or where we'd go downtown and stay at the hotel. We'd go offense against defense and – you know, we'd always beat them up pretty good because we're better athletes on defense. So uh, we had better arms. So Jay's playing one day. I had my shirt off. You know, we're all in there sweat. Don't, I mean, it's hot in there, so I took my shirt off. Jay hits me with a dodgeball right in the, I try to catch it. Hits me in the chest. I literally had a dodgeball circle in my chest <laughs> the rest of the day. I mean, he threw that ball so hard. Um, I didn't catch it. Bounced off my chest. Uh, but, and, you know, he had a good arm. Uh, I, I was proof of that with the big red mark on my chest from dodgeball that day. What has your take been on the Bears in this weird era ever since they kind of let go of all you guys? Well, since they fired Lovey. Yeah, that's when uh, it started. It's, it's, no, it started when they fired Jerry Angelo. Jerry Angelo, it started. Yeah. Jerry Angelo was a great GM. He, he knew how to put a team together. He knew how to win games. He had a, a plan, and the plan worked. You know, he was there. Uh, Jerry came in, what, 2001, 2002? And we were pretty successful when he was there through, throughout his tenure, minus the years of injuries, whatever, but everyone has those. Um, yeah, it's been weird since they fired Jerry. And then, you know, the, the new GM came in and thought it'd be smart to fire Lovey after he goes 10 and six. Um, and then ever since they did that, you know, Nagy came in and did a pretty good job. They went to the playoffs two out of the four years he was there. He gets fired. Um, I, I don't know, honestly, you know, it's, it's hard to tell. Um, I don't watch him that much anymore. I don't, I, just, I don't really follow that close because I'm not there. So I don't get the news on him. So I don't really know what's going on at a day-to-day -day level. Um, yeah, if they're on TV and we're not doing anything, I'll watch if they happen to be on, but I really don't play that close attention, honestly. So I have I was, a... I was so turned, sorry, I was so turned off when they fired Lovey. It, it really pissed me off, man. I, uh, I, there was no reason 
we were 10 and six and you know minnesota beats green bay on the last day of the regular season to knock us out of the playoffs or lovey price who knows what would have happened i mean when we go to the playoffs that year you'd never know because we were a pretty good football team we just we we, we lost a few games in the middle of the season there so it, it was it was frustrating well, the other thing was the year before that when they fired Jerry was so strange because that was a year when Jay got hurt down the stretch. Yep. It was that weird Marion Barber game where he ran out of bounds. Like it was such oh, a fumbled. weird year. I thought yeah. he fumbled there at Denver, which well, those happened. But we yeah. were seven and three, we ended up eight and eight. And they're saying that uh, I remember someone saying they fired him because he didn't have a good enough backup quarterback. You know, Jay gets hurt and we go one and seven without Jay. You just don't you're not you're not relying on a backup quarterback now these days you probably are but back then you know you didn't have to have good you don't want to put money in your backup quarterback um so yeah that, that that was a big knock from what i heard from people saying that jerry didn't have a good backup quarterback backup quarterback for jay in case he got hurt of course jay hurts his thumb against san diego that year well the thing that is so ridiculous is people want to have a plan they always are like oh let's fire this guy but you yeah. got to, whatever, it's easier to tear something down than to build something up. So what are you replacing him with? And look at what they've done for the last Ugh. 10 years, just screwing around. They've been terrible. Man, those first two guys they hired after the, uh, whoever they hired to replace Jerry, I have no idea what that guy's credentials were, or what his Phil qualifications Emery. were. Terrible, terrible decision there. Got rid of, you know, a lot of guys that were core of that team for a long time. Um, and obviously got fired lovey as well. Um I actually like Ryan Pace. I thought Ryan did a good job. Um, you know, they, they didn't win as many games as they should have, I guess. But my thing is players have to go out and play. You know, you can you can blame management. You can blame coaches. You can blame GMs. Players go out there, and they're the ones that win the games, not the GMs, not the coaches. They go out and execute game plans. If they don't, they're going to lose. That, or they make plays. That's all there is to it. You can say everything you want to about the coaches not having them ready. Players have to get themselves ready to play and execute to win games. Well, I have a Phil Emery story. You th I think Ooh. you'll like this one. Okay, I, I hope so. <laughs> so they have that day, the day after the regular season. I think they call it Black Monday, where they're always fired. Yeah, yep. So he gets fired. This is 2015. And he does a weird, like, press conference where he says goodbye. I don't know who does a press conference when they get fired. I, I never or hear Or a GM, not, not a GM at least. Yeah. So he does a press conference. He's fired. Okay, whatever. It's like a couple days after New Year's. I'm on my winter break. So me and a couple of my friends, we just saw this. There was this Mark Wahlberg movie out called The Gambler. And good you movie. A, you like it? Yeah, it was good. Um, who's the guy from Roseanne that was in there? Uh, the husband. Uh, I can't remember. I can't, oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. John Goodman. John Goodman's in it as well. Yeah, it's a good movie. So we were just the only people in this movie theater. And me, it was me and a couple of my friends. It was like, there were like five of us. And we're watching the movie and we're just being obnoxious and cracking jokes and just kind of not taking the movie very seriously. And there's one couple in this theater. We go over to Evanston Movie Theater right here down the street. Yeah. Well, guess who that couple was? Phil Emery oh, <laughs> and his wife, hours after that press conference. We basically ruined the movie for him. Like good job. Two hours after he got fired, he, he ruined some. He ruined some careers. So you, you ruin a movie is not that bad of a deal, or ended some careers that shouldn't have been ended. So uh, good job. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I'm not very fond of that guy. I, I just don't know. Like his football IQ seems really, really low to me for some reason. He doesn't seem like a guy who has a very high football IQ to be running a team. Well, what they it was a move of pride where it's like well i want to bring in my own guys so i'm going to throw out these guys who've been here yep. a long time i know that i guess i don't exactly know how things went down with you but i know that briggs was another guy who it, hester didn't finish his career with the bears and then charles tillman peanut yeah he went over and played with the panthers like I know. how on earth are you letting a guy like you who could have played longer and uh, then you know I, I was, I mean, I, I will, you will never know because I, you know, I, I was so banged up my last season that I didn't, I didn't play the level I should have played at. But I think I, if I'd done the rehab, I mean, having another offseason, the rehab, who knows what would have happened with my knee. But um, this is the thing that really makes me mad about the Bears sometimes. Like, we'll draft guys. Well, I say we as in the Bears. Draft, you know, say we get Kyle Fuller in the first round. Great draft pick. Guy plays good, gets paid. Cut him. Why? 
He's a first, he, you drafted him in the first round, and you 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 made good on one of your picks. You know, you got you actually hit a first round pick, which you don't do very often. So what do you do? Then you go and cut him for no reason. You know, and then he goes to Denver and plays well. Uh, there's somebody else. I think mean, it's like they don't take care of their own. You know, if you get especially if you get a guy in the first round and you hit on him and he does well, you end up paying him and he stays sticks around for a few years. Let him finish as a bear. It may cost you a little more. It, it may, you know, I just it just it drives me crazy because you see Pittsburgh, they do it the right way. They do things actually, like that. I'm a Steelers fan, Brian. Yeah, my wife's a Steelers fan. I, I you know, I, I like the way they run the organization. Tomlin's been there forever. Ben went out the right way. Um, Paul Amalu stayed another year. Heath, the tight end. You see their guy, their organization does that for them because they understand what those players have meant to the organization. Um, and I guess the Bears just don't care. I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't I, I, management, I have nothing. I don't know how that works, but you know, the Bears just don't do it like that. And they're one of the most storied franchises in NFL history. And we're talking about the Steelers because the Steelers do it the right way. The Steelers are a little like the uh, St. Louis Cardinals where you got Pujols and uh-huh. Yadier Molina and Adam Wainwright. They all go out together after this year. They're- after yeah, all those years. Oh, well, Pujols left there. Pujols for, came what, back. Was, yeah, I saw he was back, but he, I know he left there in the middle of his career. Um, yeah, I mean, like I said, Pittsburgh does it right, man. And that's, what, five Super Bowls, six Super Bowls, something like that? A bunch. Do you guys have a relationship with the Bears since then, or did things end just so poorly that there isn't much of a relationship there anymore? Um, th- there was, I mean, you know, George took over the team. When did George become president? And George reached out to me, and I always had a good relationship with George for the most part. Uh, he was always the, the head ticket guy when I was there. He was our, you know, he distributed our tickets for us every week. And then when I left, he became, I think, was a team president, right? Um, so, yeah, there was a little bit of, uh, you know, reconnecting, I guess, after what, maybe two or three years after I retired, all the Hall of Fame stuff rolled around. They reached out. They were very good with that. And then in about, what, 2019, 20, maybe fell out a little bit again. Some things were said publicly that maybe some people didn't agree with. And then other people said things that maybe I didn't agree with. So maybe there was a little falling out there. And I really haven't spoke to him very much since I went back to a, our old our old strength coach Clyde Emmerich passed away last year and I went back to his funeral and saw some of the uh, the uh, people still work at the Bears at the at the funeral. Who are you still tight with from your playing days? Uh, Olin, I still talk to Olin quite a bit. Uh, man, who did I see the other day? Uh, I, I honestly don't talk to that many guys to tell you the truth. Most of the guys I talk to are from other teams. <laughs> like who? <laughs> so, um, Zach Zach Thomas is a good friend of mine. Uh, who did I just see? Um, man, you know, I play all these, these golf tournaments. And I see all these guys that I played against. Uh, not so much guys that were on. I talked to Hunter every once in a while, Nick Roach, uh, AAB, Alex Brown. I talked to him quite a bit. Uh, Tank Johnson lives out here by us. So not a ton of guys, but there's a few guys that I still, uh, still can't keep up with. Now, Olin and Peanut Tillman, I believe, have both spoken out and said that they think that the Bears should consult with former players such as them, such as you, mm-hmm. about potential hires. Uh, do you like that idea? But yeah, yeah, I mean, Olin, if you could pick Olin's mind about anything, especially hiring coaches, why wouldn't you? You know, that dude did it, was one of the best in his position for a long time. He has a lot of things to say, which I like. He's very opinionated. Um, he was, same way when he played. You know, I love playing. I got to practice against the best every day. That's why. I was able to get better every year because of Olin. But, yeah, why not pick their brains? And If you don't like what they have to say, you don't have to listen to them, you know, but you can at least pick their brains and maybe just get a little more feedback from an outside voice than, uh, than yours, you know, after you go through all the NFL protocol rules for hiring coaches. Then you can maybe get some little extra input from somebody else. So this is a question I got from a listener by the name of Tommy Mantis, and Tommy really wanted to know. You had a teammate by the name of Sam Hurd who got busted yeah. for – he had some – he was drug Alleged. dealing. So. Yeah, it was – that was 2010 or nine something like that. Yeah, like yeah. a ton of cocaine or something like that. Was that something that was really obvious to the locker room, or were you guys shocked to hear about that? Yeah, no idea, man. I, I was, what guys do away from the locker room? I mean, it's not like he's bringing the cocaine in the locker room and distributing right. it. So, no, I had no idea. I heard about it at the facility. I, was, I think it was a Friday. It happened, and we were at the facility on Saturday, and they're like, Sam got arrested last night. I was like, what? And then you hear all these stories about what, you know, the Fed's doing this, doing that. You don't know what to believe. And then, you know, of course, Lovey pulls us in. He's like, ah, oh, this happened. That's it. So I was shocked. You know, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't know what to believe or what really happened because, 
no one knows except Sam, honestly, and, and the people that were involved. So I saw. Was, well, I'll, say, I'll say this: he was a good teammate. That dude busted his ass. He played hard. He practiced hard. Sorry for the a word. Uh, that's he, that's he PG rated. You can say it. Okay, good. It's jackass, right? So, so yeah, yeah he. There you uh, go. <laughs> I mean, dude practiced hard. He worked hard. Uh, always on time. Uh, so teammate wise, he he was great. I had no issues with him. Bummer that that happened with him, then. Feel bad yeah, for him. Yeah, it stinks. Yeah. Well, you got to make better decisions. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. So, who was the hardest running back to tackle? A lot of people are surprised when they ask me this question. Um, Ricky Williams, man. So, Ricky was like 5'10", 240, probably ran a 4'4". He's just short. You know, I'm 6'4". I was 255 when I played. I could not get under Ricky. And I had some good games against him. He has some good games against us. But for me, he always gave us fits. We had some good collisions. But, man, he was a pain just because of his stature and size and speed, the combination. You know, I don't mind the guys that are 6'1", 6'2", 215. Uh, I, can, I can pretty much get under their chin, no problem. But Ricky, it was always hard for me to, uh, to get under. Biggest trash talker that you played against? Olin Krutz. <laughs> about who would you play against? Olin was on my team, man. I do never <laughs> shut up. Uh, practice, I tell you what, practices were always a blast because Olin was yapping the whole time. And it keeps you, keeps you engaged in practice. Uh, there is something to trash talking in practice, when, during, especially during training camp when you're competing against the office because it gets so monotonous and boring. Every day you're going against the same guys. Unless you're competing and yapping back and forth, it's just gonna, you're not going to get any better. <clears throat> so it's nice to find someone that can kind of uh, get your competitive juices flowing. But on the uh, other teams, honestly, Jack, so I was a babysitter on the field. So I, I had to get, you know, imagine – I had to get 10 guys in the huddle, get them all the call. So I'm like, all right, guys, uh, over cover two, ready, break. And then we break the huddle. And I got Lance going, what was the call? <laughs> oh, yo, Lack, what was the call, Pep? And then I got Charles going, hey, what was the call? So just imagine how much little time I had to talk trash because I'm always trying to get guys the call, get in the huddle. Um, I don't even know. Aaron Rodgers was fun. And Brett was fun, too, because it's more banter than trash talk, honestly. Um, not a whole lot of derogatory things, just just banter back and forth, which which I enjoyed. So, like after a play ends, Brett Favre and you are just kind of cracking jokes with each other. Well, I wouldn't say cracking jokes, but just like, oh, that was a good hitter, or hey, or you know, nice throw, just just something stupid, no, nothing great. There are some things I will not say on your show because you're requesting <laughs> me not to. But you know, it, it it was all fun, fun banter, going back and forth, like competitive banter, but but fun. And you were a big Brett Favre fan, right? I grew up watching that dude um, just – and I was like I said, I was a Cowboys fan, so they played the Cowboys every year, I feel like, in the playoffs or late in the season, and I, those games always mattered, and the dude was awesome. So he was tough as hell, never missed a game, um, throwing for 300 yards, rushing, running through D linemen, uh, and then I got a chance to play against him, man. It was, it was cool as hell. Now, speaking of trash talkers, I happened across this clip when you did an event, it was with WWF or WWE. Oh my gosh! It was like <laughs> the the miniature. It wasn't one of those. It was like the under, like the minor leagues wrestling. Minor is what leagues. It was. Yeah. Well, you picked up Johnny Fairplay and you just yeah. threw him. <laughs> threw did him you know ring. Johnny Fairplay at all before that? Did no. You one that of my guy? one of my buddies asked me. He was a wrestler. His name was Eric Watts. He was like, "Hey, will you come do this event?" I was like, "Sure, I love wrestling. I'll go." And I didn't realize I was going to be participating. We get there. He's like, you want to do, you want to be in the show? I was like, what do I got to do? And he told me, I was like, yeah, this is like a blast. Dude, let's do it. And then I meet Johnny Fairplay before the show. I'm like, am I going to pick you up? And I'm like, oh yeah, you're like 140 pounds. So <laughs> I kind of practiced picking him up before the show. Um, and then obviously we did that during the thing, but it, it was awesome. You know, I was really nervous because the football, I knew what I was doing, wrestling and, and golf, stuff like that. I'm not sure what's going to happen all the time. It's a little unpredictable for me. But, you know, I almost, when I was in the ring, the guys were throwing me back and forth off the ropes, and I almost hit the rope and slipped down. You can see it if you watch it. I almost fell down. Yeah. I ended up clotheslining those two guys and then picking up fair play <laughs> and throwing them out of the ring. But that was, that was fun, man. Get a chance to do stuff like that was cool. Did you know who Johnny Fairplay was prior to that? Nope, no idea. Still don't? Still don't know who he is. Nope. He's Little guy. I know the, that much. He's been on this show before. That's why I asked. Really? Yeah. So he, was he a Survivor guy or something? Yeah, like that? he or, was on Survivor. Yeah. And yeah. he lied. He told everyone that his grandma died. And so oh, everyone geez. would feel bad for him. And he almost <laughs> won the game. As so he played the game. So yeah. he, was, he, was, he was playing the game. Good for him. <laughs> he was like, it was so funny because he, 
he had his loved one come out. They have the loved one visit, and he's like, his best friend comes out, and he's like, she died, dude. Like that's oh, his delivery man. of saying it up it. good. <laughs> so then he's like, it was my, either going to be my buddy or my grandma. My grandma's not here for a reason. So everyone feels yeah. bad. He gets to you. Ever, did you ever watch Survivor? Do you know how it works? I never watched it. No. Okay, so they have like when you get down to three people, they have one challenge. The winner of that challenge picks who goes to the final two. And the last seven people who are voted out pick who wins. So okay. the woman who won this final immunity challenge and could pick between him or someone else picked the other person to go to the end solely because she was afraid that Johnny Fairplay, if he had a million dollars, he would die because he would blow through it and do drugs and do all kinds. Oh my of gosh. <laughs> so that's why he didn't win. Oh, Johnny Fairplay man. being a scoundrel is why he didn't win. A survivor. Uh. Well, at least he played the game the way he thought it should have been played. Yeah. That's funny. Because <laughs> he I... thought he would kill himself. <laughs> too rich. <laughs> no, I just drink himself to death or too much drugs. Wow. I don't know. But man, that mm. guy, he's a he's a funny guy. Was, yeah, I'm, he's, I he's done well, believe... obviously. Yeah, I can't believe I, I saw that clip. I'm like, that's Johnny Fairplay. <laughs> he's throwing yeah, Johnny well, Fairplay. He was so tiny. He was so tiny. I was like, well, I have to throw you out. No problem, bro. Uh, you, just, <laughs> you don't know. I mean, you, you don't know how you're going to get a guy up there and you figure, you know, it's just tough. But we managed to get it done. Were you cons- were you scared that you might accidentally hurt somebody when you're doing that? So not hurt somebody, get hurt. So after after I did that, the Bears had a big, big, they made a big deal out of it. Jerry Angelo called me up to his office. He was like, you can't be participating in these things. You have to sign a waiver. Now you have to go get a physical because we don't. We think you may have hurt yourself, this and that. There's no more basketball in the Walter Payton Center because of you, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, they just flipped out because I did something that they didn't know I was going to do, basically. Um, it was dumb. You know, I I had fun. There was really very small chance of me getting hurt. Um, but I wasn't hurt. I wasn't worried about hurting anybody either, honestly. Um, fair play. They caught him. He was fine. <laughs> What was the most fun season of your career? Mm, 06, not even close. You know, we won 13 games. Um, we went to the Super Bowl, obviously. But, man, we, we just had fun. You know, we scored on defense. We scored on special teams. We scored every which way you could think of. Uh, a great group of guys. Uh, we were pretty much healthy the whole season, unless except for Mike Brown getting hurt in uh, the, the, the Arizona game. Mike got hurt. The Liz Frank injury, he missed the rest of the season. Um, but yeah, that, that, that season was a blast, man. Did you guys ever consider doing your own Super Bowl shuffle? Cause the no. fans wanted it. The fans yeah, wanted always it. wanted that. Yeah. We didn't want it. We were trying to maybe not be like, you know, uh, we, we wanted to be us. We want to be yeah. 2006 bears, not the 1985 bears. So we were, we were just kind of doing our own thing and trying to uh, maybe put some distance. Maybe we should have done one. Maybe we'd have done, we'd have done better. Won the game. <laughs> <laughs> well, that Cardinals game was I watched it last night and I had a couple of takeaways and one of them first of all I can't believe Matt Leiner's career shook out the way it did because he looked he amazing good. in that game so the first half they, they they did exactly what they wanted to do they threw the ball they threw hitches they ran it when they had to second half vanilla they handed it off like 20 something times they didn't do they didn't let him try and win the game you know they knew what coverage we were going to be in and the first half they you know they, they knew they just they just totally went vanilla on us, like on themselves, I should say. And then we, um, you know, we got some takeaways. And, but yeah, Matt, you, his first couple of games were great, and then it just didn't work out. I don't know if he got hurt or what happened. Kind of disappeared. What changed at halftime? What changed in that fourth quarter? Did someone give? Did you pump the guys up? Is no man in the NFL? You don't really need guys. To, you shouldn't need guys to pump you up, whether But you see these guys jumping around, and acting like idiots before games. If you need that to get ready to play, you're in the wrong business, man. You should Sunday is like a bonus day where you get to play football and not get in trouble for hitting somebody. You know, you get to go out there and play football for fun and get, and get paid for it. But at halftime, Owen was like, we're going to win this game. He goes, we're going to find a way. We're going to win. Love, he was like, we're going to win this game, guys. And that, that's all I remember from halftime. I don't remember the adjustments. I don't remember what, what was being said except for Owen saying, we're going to win this game. Lovey reiterated that, and we went out, and we found a way to win the game. So you mentioned you were the babysitter of the defense. Was Olin the babysitter of the offense? Oh, Olin was the leader of our team. How about that? Um, I mean, he was such a smart football player. You know, you you watch these guys, you know, you hear the quarterbacks making checks, this and that. It was Olin making the checks on our team. It was Olin saying, this guy, that guy, we're going to do all this, whatever. I don't know what the offense terminology they use, but Olin was the guy who made – 
I mean, he just he was never unprepared. He was the most prepared guy. I, I mean, he watched film. Uh, I hated watching film, so I didn't watch a lot of film. Uh, but <laughs> Olin was always ready, always knew exactly what was going on defense, what they were trying to do, who was rolling here, rolling there. Just unreal. So he was a leader not only of our offense, but our team. Well, you mentioned – we talked a little bit about Tommy Harris earlier. Mm. I thought he was a really underrated player from that era because people remember you. They remember Briggs. They remember the corners. They remember mm. Hester. They remember some, some of the offensive guys. Tommy yeah. Harris, when he was at his peak, you've talked about it earlier, he was as dynamic and explosive of a player as Man. you've seen at that position. Yeah, he, he was very underrated. You're right. And, um, you know, that it was two, he got hurt that year too, actually. 2006, Tommy ripped his hamstring off the bone. And he kind of wasn't the same after that either. You know, there was a couple – he took him probably a couple years to get right from, from that injury. But you look at that year, you know, he gets hurt in week – 12 mike brown gets hurt in week seven two of our um, in my opinion two of the better players in the nfl not just on our defense but at their positions in the nfl um but yeah tommy was so explosive man um i, I i'm telling you it didn't matter i didn't care what gap he went in if it was my gap or something i didn't care because it happened so fast that we could we could make up for it we knew where to fit off of tommy just because it happened so quick which makes it so much better for a defense because a decision's being made right now so react off that decision and go where he's not so something else I want to touch on from that year. One thing that I love that Lovey did, and honestly, I mean, I guess I'll ask you, do you remember anyone doing the – put the kickoff returner back on the field – the long field goal attempts before he did it with Nathan Vasher? And they did yeah, it again with Hester. Yeah, Nate, Nate did it in 05. Or, yeah, 05 was when Nate did it, right, against uh, Yeah, San 05, Fran. yeah, that year. Nate yeah. ran one back against Sam But Fran. before that, had you seen that much? Yeah, you know, it, it's just football. You know, if yeah. you got a guy attempting a long field goal into the wind or before halftime or, you know, whatever, you put a guy back there. I, I, I've seen it before, but the people didn't have guys like we had. They didn't have Hester's, you know, even Little Vash. And I think we practice that stuff, though. You know, it's not like we just go out there and yeah. like, oh, we're going to put a guy back there and see what happens. Uh-uh. I mean, Coach Tobe, Coach Smith, we practice that stuff. So we would put guys back there and practice. And, you know, that little wall that Vash had to run behind? We practice that. There's a reason that he ran this way and then went that way because we practice that stuff in practice. Um, and, you know, Hester, unbelievable returner. But And we had some special teams guys that understood how to block. They knew how to set guys up for blocks. And it's because in practice, man, we, we busted our – we, not me, because I wasn't on special teams. But our special teams coaches had the best game plans for a, a, of anyone. And Coach Sobes do the same thing now in Kansas City as well. They have great special teams there too. I just think that – we don't see it as much as a team. This is me speaking out of my mouth and I could be totally yeah. wrong. I just think it's interesting because if I had a Devin Hester or a guy like that, I don't even know who the guy is now in the NFL. That is that of oh, Tyree kill. Maybe if I had Tyree yeah. kill on my team and any field goal 55 or longer, I'd put him back there because then I think you could get the other coach in their head because they're going to put out their, blocking unit they're not putting out their special teams guys who are going to have to run and tackle them now i think maybe could you get in their head and think okay maybe we need to change our personnel up a little bit overthink things uh, or I mean, no no i mean as a field goal if you're, if you're trying to kick a field goal you put your field goal team out there you don't put oh hey they got a returner back there because then you're saying there's a our guy's gonna leave it short right yeah. 55 yard is a, is a chip shot these days these guys are just making them from yeah everywhere it's unreal um, so, yeah, no, I, I don't think you're going to get some, an NFL kicker's head or NFL coach's head by putting a returner back there on a field goal. I don't think that's going to do anything <laughs> to, to kind of sway their opinion on whether or not they want to kick the field goal. I mean, you, maybe just, make yourself, you may make yourself susceptible to a fake then. Yeah. You know, because you got one guy back, one, out of the, one guy out of the process of, of counting who's eligible, who's not eligible. So who knows, man? I, I don't know. You, you might be right. I could, I could be talking out of my ass like always. Who knows? <laughs> I was just thinking, I mean, what if – does a kicker – could that get in the guy's head? Like, oh, man, they think I'm going to kick it short. I, I don't know. It's just something I thought about when I was I would be surprised if the kicker day. even sees the guy back there, honestly. Yeah. I'd be shocked if he even recognizes the guys back there. Those dudes are so focused and dialed in on those little uprights that they probably don't even see the guy back there. Well, with Hester, the way that he did it, the hesitation, it was so good. It was Yes, the, yeah. the, the Giants game. Yeah, uh, you see me going like, "Wait, stay in, stay in, stay in." I was like, "Oh, he's going," <laughs> and it didn't. At that point, it didn't matter. He'd already out, outran everyone's angle anyway. So, you still have a good relationship with New Mexico? 
The Lobos, yes, yeah. yeah. So my my one of my roommates from college is now the head coach for the Lobos. Oh, da- Danny Gonzalez, yeah. Danny grew up in Albuquerque, went to school at New Mexico, uh, got into coaching, was a D coordinator here at uh, ASU for a couple of years. Then the UNM hired him as a head coach two years ago. Are they in the Mountain West? We are in the Mountain West. Yes. Yeah, I think last year was a little rough. Yeah, well, it wasn't great. Uh, the year before, we did end on like a three-game win streak. The year yeah. before, the yeah. year that every uh, there was no fans at the games, but uh, we ended up we had to they had to play all their games in Vegas because New Mexico had the super strict uh, China rules, like the strictest <laughs> rules in like the world. It's crazy. So their governor kicked everyone out of state. There's no high school football, no basketball. I think they're still wearing masks in basketball games too, actually. So yeah, their governor is really doing a great job controlling everything there. Um, but yeah, last year was a tough season for for my Lobos. Yeah. So let's see what else do I have here for you? Okay, I know. 2010 Bears, you guys went to the NFC Championship game, yeah. and you know, 06, you said that was the most fun you had, and obviously you went to the Super Bowl. But for whatever reason, the 2010 team, I feel like, just doesn't get talked about as much as the 06 team. Why we do you think good. that is? Yeah, you guys, know, cause, cause, you guys may have had an even better chance. At, yeah, you, talent. We had Jay quarterback. Yeah. Um, why? Because we didn't win that game. That's probably why they, they get, we we get overlooked a little more than maybe we should. Uh, Aaron was good that year, you know, up in Green Bay. And you know what sucks about that, Jack, is so the last game of the season we play at Green Bay, and Green Bay has to beat us to get in the playoffs. So Lovey's like, we're playing everybody. We're, we're going to beat them. They're not getting the playoffs. They beat us ten to three. At Green Bay. We couldn't score more than three points against them up there. So then we come, they get all the way back to the NFC Championship game, come into Soldier Field, beat us 21-14. You know, Aaron, Aaron didn't throw a touchdown in either of those two games. He, I think we picked him off four times in those two games, um, and we just we couldn't score against – we could not score against that defense. Our, our offense struggled mightily against them. And all three – the first time we beat them 2017 in the regular, on Monday Night Football, then they beat us 10-3, to and then beat us 21-14. Very frustrating. What was the key to stopping Michael Vick? Because you guys always handled him pretty well. We did a good job. I honestly don't know. You know, we had some athletic guys on defense we, that could run. I think that helps. And our D linemen were – we had super athletic D lines. You know, every time – oh one we beat them. Uh, in oh two we beat them in Atlanta. And then we played them in oh five at Soldier Field. Remember the freezing game on Sunday night? 2010, Philly. 11, Philly. We beat them again. We just had disciplined guys. You know, our D linemen understood – Keep this guy in the pocket. And then when he ran, he's running to me, Lance, Nick Roach, Hunter. We got some guys that can run at linebackers. So we just did a good job of tracking him down. 2010 was such an exciting time for me because I thought my two favorite teams were going to play in the Super Bowl. I thought it was going to be Steelers, Steelers and Bears. Yeah. That was Steelers like and Christmas Packers. Morning. Yeah. <laughs> <That'd have> been, <laughs> I mean, I would not have been mad if we had that matchup. I'll tell you that much. Uh, yeah. We, uh, we just could not get it done that year. It's frustrating. I mean, I, I, I do think you guys would have beaten the Steelers if you. Had I agree it. with you for sure. Yeah, no doubt. I, I think you look at. Well, uh, I say that. So their defense is. They they did a lot of things on defense that would. And our offense was not great that year. You know, we we ran the ball pretty good, but you know we did give up. Some, I think we got sacked ten times against the Giants that year in, in one game. Um, so you know what they did really well was pressure the quarterback. So we we may have had a hard time defensively. I think we'd have been okay. But offensively, we may, we may have had some issues. Brian, do you watch Curb Your Enthusiasm? I do not, no. No, you don't? No, I, I've, I've seen clips of it. It's funny. It's Larry David, right? Yeah, Larry David. Yeah, yeah, he's a funny guy. But I don't, I don't like sit down and watch the show. I think I have an idea of how we could get you on an episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm. What's your idea? I think what we got to do, we got to pitch this to somebody. I don't know if you know anyone in Hollywood, your agent's got somebody. Nope, not anymore. <laughs> We'll just make this clip go viral. That's what we'll do. Okay. Yes, there you go. The idea is Larry David, and Jeff Garland, by the way. Do you ever meet Jeff Garland? He was a I met Jeff guy. when I did Family Feud uh, like three or four years ago. We did Family Feud. We did the Hall of Fame versus uh, the current NFL players, and he was doing the show right after ours. So I met him right there at the Family Feud little cross-through place. Nice guy. Funny guy. And he's probably a big fan of yours. He said he was. He might not be. I mean, you know, everyone says that, but I see you. You never yeah. know. Well, he's a Chicago <laughs> yeah. guy. He's a big he is, Chicago yes, he guy. Yes, yep. So I think what we got to do is early in the episode, Jeff Garland is watching an old Bears game on his TV. He's watching 
you guys. He's watching. Let's say he's watching the Cardinals game Monday night. Okay. He's watching mm-hmm. that, and then they start talking about, "Ooh, Brian Erlacher, man, that guy's great. He can." And Larry David says something. He can really rock a bald head. <laughs> then they yeah. later. You run into him. You're wearing your hat that you're wearing right now, and you yep. take your hat off, and he finds out that you have hair. And Larry oh, bro, look David, at my hair right now. Look how messy my hair is right now. But Speaking it's of hair. I need it's a haircut hair. so bad. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I got a I got a power muff, bro. I need it. My wife needs to cut it. To, we have a haircut plan tonight. Look at this thing, just going every which direction. But it's, yeah, it's, bad. it's better than no hair. Agreed. I, yeah. I do enjoy having the opportunity to have hair now. It's exciting. So Larry finds out that you have hair and he confronts you and he's like, how could you leave the brotherhood? (laughs) Yeah. That's That's, an episode of Curb right there. That's pretty good. Is that so, (laughs) are they still running that show? Yeah. They they, they still make new episodes? Yeah. Oh, okay. I haven't haven't heard anything about it in a while. They did a season last year. Last year. They did. Okay, good. All right, good. Yeah. Oh, Larry David's funny dude, man. He's hilarious. Yeah, he's a funny guy. Even though you don't watch Curb, you seem like a guy who's pretty... You watch a lot of movies. Did I mention the game? Yeah, like, huge, oh yeah, I remember the game. Right? Huge movie guy. Huge movie guy. Love movies. Uh, even even shows. You know, I I I I don't watch it on the regular. Your show you just talked about, the uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm, but I have seen episodes of it. I just don't. It's not one of my go tos. Okay, what are the what are your go tos? Oh, Naked and Afraid, um, Bering Sea Gold, Gold Rush, um, Billions, um, Ozark. What's the one that – oh, Yellowstone, duh. Yellowstone, That's my favorite show yeah. ever. Yellowstone's unbelievable. Uh, and then, of course, like there, there was Game of bad. Thrones. You haven't seen Yellowstone? I heard it's like Breaking Bad in, like, the best scenery in, in like, Montana, right? Uh, yeah, it's not – no, Breaking Bad – Breaking Bad – I watched Breaking Bad, too. It took place in Albuquerque, but Yellowstone's better. Yeah, Breaking Bad's great, don't get me but Yellowstone's better. Yellowstone. Great show. Man, so, stressful. I don't watch a whole lot of shows, honestly, because I'm watching sports most of the time. Like I'm watching like really? two baseball games a night. So I'm the opposite of you. I'm I'm not watching sports. I'm watching shows now. <laughs> <laughs> we are the exact opposite. I, I'm addicted to uh, to Naked and Afraid, and all those shows on uh, Discovery Channel are great. Uh, Deadliest Catch, King Crab Fishing. I just those shows are. I've been watching those shows for years. If you had to go on a reality TV show, what would it be? That's a good question. Um, dang, Jack. Good I'll question, give you some dude. shows like the mainstream okay. ones. You got like Survivor, Big Brother, Amazing Race. You could run the Amazing Race with one of your former no. teammates. I've never no. seen any of those. I've never seen any of those shows. Um, you go on Naked and Afraid. I want to go on Swim Trunks and Afraid. How about that? <laughs> How about I get to wear swim trunks and everyone else gets to be naked? But I want to. I'm going to go on Swim Trunks and Afraid and uh, try and. Dude, I would be so moody because. If I don't eat, I get really, really pissy. So I would not be good on that show. I think I could survive, I, but I got to find food right away. I got me <laughs> and my partner better freaking find some shelter. We need to build you up, but we got to get food immediately and water. Scott Pollard did 30 days on Survivor at six mm-hmm. foot 11. That's pretty okay. remarkable. Like that's is it? Yeah, I think to be. Well, I don't a watch Survivor. That, I don't know what the premise is. I don't know if they like give them food or if they have to fend for themselves. Or they have to fend for themselves. There's no food. There's nothing around. Is it like being on Naked and Afraid where they give them nothing to get the food with? It's just they on have, your own? They have ri- rations of rice. That's it. And well, they, can go they, and catch, and they can go catch chickens or go fishing. They mainly fish. Yeah, that's what they're saying. Yeah. Naked and Afraid is pretty much yeah. the same way. Lots of fishing. Yeah. yeah. So you, you think no you can handle that? I would love to try. Honestly, you know, I, these shows are, are amazing. Oh, another good show is A Life Below Zero. Really Life Below show. Zero. That sounds like another Ooh. one of those. Alaskan show, basic... Survivor. Alaskan. Yeah. Alaskan Life Below. It's a great movie. Just, there's so many good shows, man. Always Were something you... on. <laughs> Were you watching The Draft? No. No. No, don't watch that stuff, really. So you just watch Saturday, Sundays, that's it? Yeah, nothing that's about else? it, man. Not really. I mean, Monday, if it's on, you know, if there's nothing yeah. else on TV, we'll watch it on Monday nights. Uh, I love it during the season. College, they got Mac Maction on Tuesday, Wednesday nights. That's a big deal. I like watching the Maction games for the Mac there. Uh, Thursday night football when it's on. Uh, and then for Friday nights, we have high school football. So it's great. When you played here in Chicago, where'd you live? I lived in Libertyville area, Vernon Hills, uh, like five minutes from the facility. It was perfect. Is that where most Bears guys live? 
So when I play, that's where most guys live. Now I think a lot of guys live downtown. They're kind of like that, you know, up-tempo lifestyle. I, from what I hear, a lot of guys get further south. But I, I really enjoy living in that area, man. We had, had a nice place back there in the woods. Um, no one really knew where I lived. It was great. Yeah, I know some of the guys are around Glencoe, Winneka, like around here. Actually, yeah. Gary Wood still lives around here. Does he? Nice. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a good, great area. You know, Winnetka's awesome. The whole Willamette, all that area is nice. But we, I just wanted to be as close to the facility as I could be. Yeah. You know, the less time in the car was always a good thing for me. Well, people will see Bears players around the suburbs. No one ever sees Cubs players. The Cubs players all live in Wrigleyville, I think. Oh, they do? Oh. That'd be my guess. They're in the city, for sure. And Sox players yeah, are I mean, somewhere south. Yeah, it just makes sense, you know, especially with the traffic in Chicago to be closer to where you work. So you're not sitting in the car. You're not, you know, worried about being late all the time because you're going to get stuck in traffic. It just, you know, makes sense for, for those guys to live closer. Was there a little bit, going back to when you played in the 2000s, was there a little bit of like an athlete bubble? Like, did were you friends with anybody from the Cubs, the White Sox, Bulls? Not really, no. man. I hardly ever saw those guys anywhere. I'm good friends with Jeremy Roenick now, but I didn't know JR when I played. Um I don't even know if he was there when I played. No, he wasn't. I think but he was I didn't watch ho- I didn't I didn't watch hockey anyway, so it didn't matter. Uh, I didn't know who he was. <laughs> um Bulls, no. Uh, baseball, not really. No, I mean I didn't really I didn't really run any of those guys or or see him out. And if we would, we'd we 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 you know, we'd exchange pleasantries, but we really didn't I didn't really hang out with any of those guys. Is there uh, how would you describe Chicago as a sports town to someone who's never been here? Amazing. Our fans are from a football perspective. The best fans, you know, the, uh, it didn't matter how bad we were. And we had some crappy, crappy seasons, man. Um, we just go through them. Our fans didn't care. They were there no matter what. Those games are cold, cold, cold in the winter. And they were always there, always rooting for us. Uh, cannot say enough about that. But pretty knowledgeable as well. You know, they knew when to cheer, when not to cheer. Um, but they, they're devoted, man. They love they love the Bears. Uh, the other sports are the same way, I'm sure. But uh, I know when it came to us, they were they were pretty crazy. I think it's baseball and football right now. I think they go crazy for the Cubs, the White Sox, and the Bears. And the Bulls' mm-hmm. interest has really faded since the Jordan. Has it? There was, oh, a yeah, nice, I mean, my... there was a nice like revival with Derrick Rose, but ever since they traded yep. him, I think people don't care about the Bulls the way they used to. And the Blackhawks, when they're good, people are in the Blackhawks. Yeah. But it's been a are they good? Week. Not right now. They're not good right now. Yeah, yeah. I, I really. So I grew, I grew up in New Mexico, so we didn't have hockey where I grew up. So when I got there, people were like, "Oh, you, you're gonna be at the Black Blackhawks." I'm like, "Great, what's that?" They're like, "Oh, it's our <laughs> hockey team." I'm like, "Oh yeah, you know, I'm really." Uh, and I, and they, I think they were good when we when I lived there. They were pretty good from what I from oh, what I remember. Were. Um, I just don't. I never had any interest in going to a game or watching or just wasn't my thing, man. What did they ever try to twist your arm and have you throw out a first pitch or something? I threw out a first pitch at a Cubs game. I did that early on in my like my first year, second year. I did that a couple times and then blah. And I grew up a Cubs fan, by the way. Oh, WGN. really? WGN. Uh, it was WGN and TBS in the summer. You know, they were on every day. Uh, so it was the Cubs and the Braves. Those are my two teams. Were you watching when they won the World Series? Yes. My, so my daughter, my middle daughter, loves the Cubs. So we're watching, and it's something ha- – I want to say the Indians went up or, or something happened during the – late in the game. Like, was it game six or seven? I don't, I don't game remember. Seven, the, game seven, rain delay. Se- yeah, something happened. Like, they hit a home run or something. It yeah. was a big, big play, and she was like mm, – she almost started crying. I was like, oh, my gosh, she's really into this. And then, obviously, the Cubs ended up winning the game. But it was fun to watch her <laughs> kind of go through those emotions <laughs> of her favorite team winning because she, she was a big Cubs, Cubs fan. Yeah, that was an emotional night for me, Brian. That was uh, – Was it? Yeah, Rajay Davis. I mean, 100 years. Yep, and Rajay Davis hits the big – it was a three-home run to tie the game. They were up five runs, six runs, and – That's what it was. They came yeah. back on him, yes. And it's just like, here we go again. This is life as a Cubs fan. It's, it's going to happen cursed. again. Cursed. And then the rain delay – kind of washes everybody clean. They get a nice little reset and they come out and they win. And I still, I still can't believe it happened. I still, it's still like, I can't believe that happened. It's crazy. I mean, yeah. I was watching, I was like, they, they finally won. I can't believe they won. Most exciting moment for you as a fan of a team. Good question. Man, you, you got some stumpers here, bro. Uh, most exciting <laughs> Hopefully you're having fan. fun. Yeah. I'm trying to think of this one. 
Shoot, man. Um, I don't know. That's, that's impossible. I mean, uh, well, gosh. who are your teams? Let's start. Let's go through that. Okay, uh, Cowboys. That's it. New Cowboys, Mexico, the, Lob- the, Lob- the Lobos and the Cowboys. You like the Cubs when you were younger, but not when I was really. younger. I liked them. Yeah, I'm kind of swayed away from that. Don't. Oh, the Braves. I, I was I'm happy to see the Braves won the World Series. Uh, yeah. Whenever they won that recently, last year. Uh, yeah, that. But yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know, man. It's tough. I don't. Know. <laughs> What's I, I, I'm not like a I'm not like a super fan, so it's kind of hard to uh, to have a moment. What's something about yourself that would surprise people who don't know you? Hmm. Well, I don't know if this is a surprise. I'm pretty competitive at everything I do, whether it's <laughs> like I don't let my kids win at anything. If we're competing, I'm trying to, but whether it's horse, ping pong, uh, bags, I'm trying to win. I don't give a hell what we're playing for or what the circumstance is. <laughs> if they beat me, it's because they beat me, not because I let them win. So I am um, very competitive at everything. Who is the craziest guy that you played with? Craziest teammate? Craziest? Like a Ooh. guy that would be scary when you get out of that football field. Dusty Dvorak was pretty intense. Dusty was a good teammate. He he was uh you know he had the long hair and the tattoos, but he would paint, put eye black all over his face. <laughs> he he looked the part, man. He looked like Latimer from uh, the program. Uh, so Dusty was pretty intense, and, and he was pretty vocal out there as well. And he played with Tommy at OU too. They did, yes. Yeah, yep. that's a pretty good D line right there. Yeah, did they? Was there ever anything going? Were they going back and forth with Vasher at all, or the Texas guys? They may have been. I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure they did. You know, the, the, that game week, you know, when they play each other, uh, I'm sure there was some trash talking and some wagers being made during the uh, during the week. Favorite movie or movies? Because you mentioned movies. Dude, just, movie yeah, you, movies. Okay, here we go. On my iPad, we have Braveheart. We have The Last Samurai, Gladiator, Old School. Old School. Oh, wedding, my gosh. What a great Wedding movie. Crashers. Wedding Crashers. Um, Silver Linings Playbook. Great pick. That is great a movie. great movie. Great movie. I'm leaving something out too, man. You, you really put me on the spot because I, I can name 50. Honestly, there's so <laughs> many movies that really get me excited. Um, Shawshank Redemption, whenever it's on TV, I cannot change it. It's unbelievable. Um, Silver Lang's playbook, what I love about that movie is how they incorporate the real Eagles and Philly season yeah, how about into that? the story. It's so good. It's good. How about Chasing Mavericks? Another one of my favorites. I haven't seen that one. Oh, you got to watch it, man. Gerard okay. Butler. It's about it's a surfing movie, but it's way beyond surfing. surfing. I like that. Uh, but it's not really not about surfing. It's about something else. It's a it's a great movie. Uh, it's old too. Uh, it's based on a true story as well. Um, dude, there's so many good movies. Horrible Bosses is a great one. It's on my iPad. Yeah. Saving Saving Private Ryan. Love Saving Classic. Private Ryan. Forrest Gump's on my iPad too. Oh, uh, I mean, I can movie. I can go on and on, man. I, I'm a movie <laughs> guy, like I said. I can go on and on. Uh, Scarface, love that one. So yeah, I got a bunch. Heat, okay. you ever seen Heat? Have not seen Heat. Oh man, well you're young. You probably probably I, uh, like Casino. I said, Brian, I just Goodfellas. Don't... Oh, I watched. Uh, yeah, Goodfellas is me and my dad. That's one of our favorite movies. Goodfellas, Great movie. The Departed. Departed. That's also on my thing. Good one. Yeah, watch that too. That's a great. There's so many good ones, man. Uh, Rounders. Um, just, just a, a ton of them. I love movies. I'm the guy who does his job. You must be the other guy. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's good. Yep. Oh, it's so good. Okay, we're talking about Those accents that are so. Oh, here's a good one for you. The town. That's, oh my gosh, what a great that's movie. Legit stressful movie. Oh my goodness, whose car are we gonna take? <laughs> Who's ca- I, I gotta. I get. You can never tell anybody. Uh, you can never tell anyone. You can never ask me about it. Whose car are we gonna take? <laughs> Jeremy, Jeremy Renner is the best. The best comeback ever. Who's Kyle going to take? I love it. <laughs> um, well, I know you did a little bit of acting. You were on an episode of The Morning of Jim, right? Yeah. yeah. How was that? 2001. That was fun. Uh, Jim Belushi's the man. It was fun. It, made me, it really made me feel comfortable because when I'm 22 years old. I was stressed out. I'd never done anything like this before. I met you know, all these actors around me. Didn't know what was going on, but Jim was awesome. So cool to be around and obviously Chicago guy, so that was cool as well. Do you have a good Jim Belushi story from off camera? I, I don't remember any of it. It was 2001, uh, like yeah, I said. I don't I mean, Dude, I was so nervous the whole time. I didn't want to screw up um, any other stuff. So I was just trying to do exactly what they told me to do the whole time. So Belushi, Bill Murray, Jeff Garland, Vince Vaughn, a lot of yep. Chicago area guys. I'm sure you've met many of them 
over the years, who was the biggest fan? Who was, was anyone like, oh my gosh, Brian Urlacher? Garland. Garland was awesome because I didn't I didn't recognize him right away as I'm, we're, we're kind of crossing and I didn't know that they were filming a show right after ours. And he was like, Brian Urlacher. I was like, what's up? He's like, Jeff Garland. I was like, oh, dude, well, I know who you are. And then we kind of hit it off. But I, you know, I've met Bill, Bill Murray. I've, I've met, uh, I've been around Vince a couple of times. Um, I guess I Belushi back in the day. But yeah, uh, Ashton Kutcher is a, a pretty big, he's not a Chicago guy, but he's a pretty big Bears fan. I've been around him a couple of times. But yeah, Gar- Garland was pretty solid with his, uh, just like, hey, Brian, he, he was pumped. <laughs> oh, I love him. He's great. He's funny. Man. Brian, this was so much fun. I feel like we were able to cover so much, and you were scared that we were going to have to fill a whole two hours. You <laughs> well, you scared me with your, oh, is two to four okay? I'm like, two to four? We're going to talk about it for two hours, dude. <laughs> and then we've been on for an hour and a half already, and we've done a pretty good, my, my jaw's getting sore from, from yapping, but you did a good job. You kept oh, me busy the whole time. I appreciate yeah. it. Well, Brian, I want to give you a chance to plug anything uh, that or promote anything that you're working on. So you want to throw out your social media handle, anything like that? I don't even know what my social media handle is, bro. But yeah, good you times on your show. put it in there at the bottom. It's B Erlacher at B Erlacher 54. I didn't put that. anything in. I didn't put anything in. My wife probably did it because I'm not good at doing anything <laughs> that has to do with um, computers or any of that stuff. So she probably, it's probably plugged in for my StreamYard thing is what it is. Uh, okay, so you've yeah. used StreamYard before. Yeah, oh, dude, during the uh, the pandemic, like we did um, uh, <laughs> StreamYard, Zoom, all that crap. Everyone was using everything. So yeah, I, I did like, a bunch of that stuff. I feel like people are always like, "What's the Streamyard?" It looks like Zoom. So annoying. The first time I used it, I could not get my volume to work, and I was just like going back and forth with this guy forever, and I just gave up. I was so mad. <laughs> you just but you did a good job. It worked on yours, so we're good. That's good. All right. Well, yeah. make sure you guys follow him. He's on Instagram. He's always pulling pranks on people with Zeke. <laughs> the snake. <laughs> Those are great. I love that. Uh, well, how do I get anybody anymore? I don't understand. I have one from the other day that I haven't posted yet. It's kind of uh, blocked out, but you can see the guy's feet just go up in the air when he gets scared. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's so good. I'll, I'll post it one of these days. But, yeah, it's fun, man. I love playing golf and, you know, messing with people. I'll tell you what. And we won't give away the whole Zeke thing here on the podcast because we don't want people to listen and then yeah, yeah. then know what's what's coming. I'll tell you what, next time I'm out in Phoenix, you and I hit the links. I'll bring yeah. someone with and they don't know about well, Zeke. I'm gonna I'll get you, don't worry about it. Because you, you'll be so interested in your, your golf shot or <laughs> people literally like, every time I play, they're like, Oh, I knew you were gonna do this, and I still get them because you're like, oh my like, dang, that was a great shot, bro. And we're talking. I'm, like, I'm not gonna tell you what I do because then you'll, you'll be expecting it. Yeah, anyway, yeah. I'll get you. Don't worry about it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Bring somebody, but I'll get you. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds yeah. good, Brian Erlacher. Always, this was a blast. Thank you so much for coming yeah. by. Thanks, Jack. Take care, brother.